There might be some people coming late. Uh, uh, some, I'd already had a couple of apologies because I washed away uh, by the rain. Uh, anyway, um, please so welcome uh, one of our university professors, Ivan Light, who is uh, currently work with Professor of Sociology Emeritus, yes. now uh, the author of six books, pretty much uh, all in the, same, in the field of uh, immigration, entrepreneurship, and and urban sociology. He's done so received a number of uh, awards, um, among them the Thomas Anselmiecki Book Prize um, for Deflecting Immigration from the International Migration Section of the American Sociological Association. Uh, also uh, worked for the Distinguished Contribution to Scholarship by the Pacific Sociological Association and a few other honors, so uh, too long to read them all. Oh, yes, but we don't want to bore yeah. Yeah. And uh, today, uh, I was going to talk about migration history in the United States from 1880 to 1924. We do the usual format, uh, 40 minutes, 35, 40 minutes, 45, depends, and then open question time, okay? Thank you, Andreas. It's very kind of you. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm uh, I have um, I have been consistently misunderstanding what's going on here. Um, I thought I was addressing Andrea's students today. Um, why, did, why did I think that? I don't know, but that's what I thought. But anyway, it doesn't matter. It's the same presentation now. But um, uh, I don't, let me explain how this paper got written. I have a colleague named uh, Ruben Hernandez Leon. It was very interested in the concept of, uh, of migration industry, as indeed am I. And he wrote uh, several papers and a book really dealing with the migration industry uh, between Mexico and the uh, United States. That's the major migration now from to the United States to Mexico. Um, it's a very high volume of migration. A third of our migrants are uh, from Mexico. And in the last uh, 20 years, a tenth of the population of, my, of Mexico has migrated to the United States. So it's a big deal. Mexico is not a small country. Um, <clears throat> at any event, Ruben uh, has written on this subject. Uh, I will get into what the migration industry is in just a moment. And then uh, he decided to edit a book on the subject and asked me if I would contribute. And I suggested, <clears throat> since most of the, the, all the other contributors are writing a uh, contemporary projects using this concept that I would write a historical number on it, uh, something that comes easily to me. I've done a lot of historical research in my time. And, uh, I enjoy doing it, and I knew something about this subject, so that's how this paper got came to be written. And it was also written as a contribution to an edited volume, which means that instead of being a journal article, I could, uh, which would require an independent review of the literature, you just basically assume that the editor has done the review of literature, you can take in at the beginning of your uh, project, taking into, uh, taking for granted the familiarity of the uh, readers with the basic concept and the conceptual underpinnings of it, which is why if you read this paper, uh, which some of you may have, I don't know, <laughs> uh, you wonder where's the review of literature, and the answer is there's not much of a one, and were I to rewrite it, um, I would uh, I would have to put that in, um, and indeed I may have to do it because he's have some, having some trouble finding a publisher for his book, so I may have to rewrite it as a uh, as, a, as a journal article to get it finally printed uh, into print. Um, at any event, the concept of the migration industry is is, uh, is what underlies this paper, and I'm I'd like to explain it briefly. Um, I'm not sure how familiar any of you are with the migration literature. You don't need to be terribly familiar with that or a genius to understand that the basic ideas in the migration literature from the get-go until the present are push and pull. <laughs> to have an explanation of migration even to today, you need to have a push and you have to have ideally a pull or maybe both. One or the other, but possibly both. You've got to show that there's a push, people leaving for a reason. That's, for example, the, uh, the migration of the Irish from uh, Ireland uh, as a result of the uh, famine. Or a pull, the attraction, let's say, of high wages and so on. Those are the, the, uh, 
conceptual ideas that have underlaid uh, migration sociology for a very long time. They can be integrated with other things in a number of ways. And uh, that's what I'm like to discuss now, because what I'm going to discuss with the migration industry is neither proportional or full. Um, it's more like a lubricant. Uh, and I would say that in the last uh, uh, 25 years, the main interest, uh, conceptual interest in the field of immigration sociology has not been with pushes or pulls, which are very easy to understand, but has been uh, with um, various forms of facilitation or lubricants. Um, and to illustrate the difference, I would like to have you imagine, and this is something that's not in the book, and I think if I were to rewrite the paper, I would put in. Imagine that um, <clears throat> you have a, we have here a heavy log that's on the ground. We want to move it from one place to another. And so to, to do that, we need to push it and to pull it. But if we lift it up and put it on wheels in a cart, for example, and we propel it one way, one way or another, the cart itself is neither a push nor a pull. It's a facilitator, but it enables us, with a very much reduced push or pull, to move the log. So, uh, and so, given, uh, given the amount of push and the amount of pull we have, we can move the log a lot farther with the cart than without it. So, in a certain sense, that's sort of what the migration industry is. It is a facilitator of, of migration. It is one example of a, uh, of a facilitation, a lubricant to migration, which is neither a push nor a pull. It is not in itself an explanation of migration. Just as the, moving the log requires an input of labor, push and pull, and the cart does not move the labor, as, excuse me, doesn't move the, uh, the log, but with the push and with the pull, the cart assists in moving. And so the migration industry is not by itself going to be an explanation of migration, but in conjunction with pushes and pulls, then you get a much enhanced uh, explanation of migration than you otherwise would have. Another um, facilitation idea related to the migration industry, but different then, is the use of social networks to explain migration. That's big time in, uh, in, the, in the field of migration. And so it is, again, not by itself an explanation of migration, but in conjunction with pushes and pulls, it becomes uh, a, uh, a concept that greatly enhances our ability to understand uh, migration. Uh, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the migration industry, which is another concept similar to it, but different, and important, but not as central to the field as social networks. Now, I have to sit in the corner because someone walked away with the, with the, the, with the remote. So I have to sit here to operate the slides. <clears throat> uh, now I'm about to try this. There we go. Okay, so uh, starting the uh, the presentation. Oh, the reason for 19, 1880 to nineteen twenty four. Um, that is basically the uh, the period of the, the the great European migration in the uh, to the United States, starting around eighteen eighty and ending in nineteen twenty four with the passage of a restrictive immigration act. Um, so that's why I picked that uh, that period. Now, um, I start with the Dillingham Commission. The United States Senate undertook a massive study of immigration in 1910. The editor was William Paul Dillingham, and the whole project became known as the Dillingham Commission. And the Dillingham Commission inquired into the causes of European immigration, which was then very high level and provoking a lot of uh, opposition and resentment in the country, as immigrations often do. Um, and so uh, the Dillingham Commission, in the course of its inquiry, identified main causes of European immigration. There were two. One was called the advice and support of friends and kin, which really turns into um, the social network theory of migration which I just mentioned is a facilitation of migration idea. And the other, the propaganda conducted by steamship ticket agencies, which is close to what is meant by the migration um, industry. So these were their ideas. The Dillingham Commission thought that the steamship ticket agents presented an overly rosy view of immigration, 
that ignored the real hardships and risks of it, and their motive was to pro promote ticket sales so that they had uh, they produced uh, glossy brochures and uh, advertising, basically what we would have to call advertising, to promote the idea that uh, um, immigration to the United States was going to offer the immigrant a really nice future and that things were going to be wonderful there. And so the immigrants classically arrived with uh, unrealistic expectations of what they were going to find. Uh, and the Dillingham Commission inquiring into this thoughts, well, the reason is they've been misled, partially by uh, what they've learned from other sources, but partially by these te steamship ticket agents who wanted them to believe that things were, uh, that the future that lay uh, ahead of them if they chose to emigrate was going to be much rosier than in reality it was. And so they were peddling a lot of nonsense in the interest of promoting ticket sales. And you could see that if they succeeded in doing this, which according to the Dillingham Commission they did, then the result would be that many more people would emigrate who than otherwise would have. So you'd have uh, an exaggeration or an enhancement of immigration as a result of the propaganda conducted by the steamship ticket agents, which is fundamentally the same idea that underlies my colleague Ruben Hernandez Leon and his study of the uh, bus route between uh, Monterey, Mexico and Houston, Texas. Uh, a bus route that takes Mexicans from, from Monterey to, uh, to Mexico and uh, basically made life very easy for them to uh, accomplish this transition and also peddled a lot of uh, rosy uh, information about how things were going to be for them once they got to the United States. So this concept of streets are paid with gold is kind of <laughs> as the terminology had taken over from the, era, from the 19th and early 20th century. Most immigrants didn't really expect golden streets, although it was said that they expected streets paved with gold. But many greenhorns expected better social and economic conditions than they actually misled. Then they found them. They'd been misled and 40% repatriated. It's a little known statistic. Of those who arrived in the United States, 40% returned home. Um, so everyone didn't like it, many returned home for various reasons, but one reason was they were disappointed in what they found, and so they went home. Somewhat later, uh, a, a, so a social scientist, I guess he was a sociologist, by the name of Henry Pratt Fairchild, became the dominant figure in this field in the 1920s, and writing again about this topic, distinguished natural causes of immigration from artificial causes. Uh, I don't know whether we would like to maintain that concept, but uh, it, it's, uh, you can see where he's coming from. The natural causes reflected, in his opinion, the superiority of economic conditions in the destination relative to the country of origin and would, would be measured by, let's say, comparative wage rates or the size of your home or a standard of living or something like that. Uh, and then artificial causes reflected the stimulation of the desire and determination to migrate by the introduction of dissatisfaction with existing conditions. This again was an illusion. The artificial was an illusion created by somebody uh, somewhere with the result that some of the immigrants, or not some, but many of the immigrants came to the United States were under uh, misapprehensions of what they were going to find and were going to be unhappy with it. Uh, he then went into artificial stimulation. He thought there were two artificial stimulators, family and friends on the one side, steamship companies and labor agents on the other. So basically the same distinction that was made 10 years earlier by the, um, 15 years earlier by the Dillingham Commission. Um, Fairchild lumped together the advice and assistance of friends and relatives and the commercial propaganda of the steamship companies which the Dillingham Commission had uh, separated. Like the Dillingham Commission, Fairfield agreed that immigration was greater in volume that it really should have been, thanks to external and misleading influence exerted by interested parties, of which one was the steamship companies and their affiliates, the labor recruiters. Often labor recruiters, people uh, connected to, uh, uh, to job opportunities in the States, worked for steamship companies and um, had offices in steamship companies. So these two were hard to separate. They were maybe, uh, in terms of the bookkeeping, they were separate. But as far as their influence was concerned, they were very close. <clears throat> now, we've got evidence here that the concept of, uh, of uh, 
migration industry was very familiar um, in uh, 1911 and again in 1925 by the migration industry. I, I mean, and Ruben means um, the existence of uh, commercial entities that have uh, a motive to, f to promote and encourage migration to uh, a particular country and whose influence in so doing then becomes a kind of a lubricant that, that produces migration above and beyond the migration that would have occurred without it. So that if you explain, try to explain the actual volume of migration that occurred, how many migrants you got, you get more than you would have done had there not been this interested group of persons involved, involved who, for whom the stimulation of migration was a, 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 a commercial interest of their own. So that's what is meant by the migration industry and their importance is that they promote migration, they encourage migration, they generate more migration than otherwise would have existed had it not been for their uh, inter intervention. And the reason they intervene is they have a direct commercial stake in the outcome of it. That's what the migration is, migration industry is. You can see the importance of it in terms of migration theory. It is an in and of itself, not a push. It is not a pull. But it does promote push and pull so that given uh, slight uh, propensities to migrate, that the uh, maximum uh, effectiveness is achieved from the uh, propensity to migrate in the uh, originating country, and more people choose to migrate than otherwise would have done so without their intervention. Now, um, if we turn to the Immigration Act of 1891, which is even which is 20 years earlier than the Dillingham uh, Commission, we find additional evidence that they already understood the concept of migration industry in 1891. Um, I think actually we could go back to the middle of the 19th century, but this is good enough. Um, the Act of, of 1891 forbade the entry of persons who have been induced or solicited to migrate to this country by offers or promises of employment usually made to them by labor agents. The labor agents, as I mentioned, often associated with um, steamship companies. So the steamship companies and the, and the labor agents are two conceptually independent uh, per personalities, each of which has a motive to promote uh, migration. The labor agents get paid for producing workers who show up in the United States and are ready to work. The steamship company gets paid if someone buys a ticket to the United States. So both of them are, have an affiliated uh, motive. Both go to work, both encourage migration, both uh, encourage and produce more migration than otherwise uh, <clears throat> would have happened. The uh, Immigration Act of 1891, you see, didn't work. But the point is that the authorities were already trying in 1891 to shut down the migration industry because they thought that by shutting down the migration industry, they could reduce the volume of migration to the United States. And this was something they wanted to do. Um, the intent of the regulation was to deprive labor contractors in Europe of their ability to promise employment in the United States to working class Europeans still in Europe. Uh, and the drafters of the act thought that the promoters and steamship companies swelled the volume of immigration beyond its appropriate and desirable limit. Expecting too much more immigrants came the job and housing opportunities were readily available. And uh, as a result, you had unemployed and poorly housed people uh, who, for whom there was no job and no housing, or inadequate housing, inadequate jobs. When they got there, the, the theory was that they could be prevented from migrating, then there would be less of this than there otherwise would have been. Uh, Section 7 of that act provided that, quote, no transportation company or, owner, or owners of vessels engaged in transporting aliens shall encourage the immigration of any aliens into the United States. The steamship companies were to become neutral transportation agents strictly. They were not to encourage the immigration of people into the United States with promises of advantageous outcomes for them. The intent was to disconnect the ability of the steamship companies to delude the European working class with idle dreams of easy prosperity in the United States. Now, we get back into the migration industry of what it is. Uh, Ruben, you see, whom I'm quoting here, said it's a it's an ensemble of entrepreneurs who, motivated by the pursuit of financial gain, 
provide a variety of services facilitating human, human mobility across international borders. And he's thinking, uh, in, in, in writing this, probably of this literature here, and not only that, of what his, he himself has seen with regard to the bus line uh, that picked up uh, Mexicans in, uh, in Monterey, Mexico, and brought them to uh, Houston, Texas, where more or less the same kind of thing is going on, the stimulation of migration by the bus line in order to sell tickets on the bus route. Um, so then Rubin comes to this uh, definition of the migration industry. It comprises a broad set of actors and services that play an active role in every step of the process of migration and are present in different types of migratory movements. Now, this lecture, this presentation is about is the satisfactoriness of that definition. That's what it's about. And I'm basically going to be arguing here that um, an understanding of the migration industry as limited to the transportation agencies is a too narrow an understanding of the migration industries and that we should broaden our understanding of it. I'm not quarreling with the concept of the migration industry. I think it's, it's a great concept and it opens a great, the door to a lot of a better and enhanced understanding of immigration. But I think that restricting the definition to the transportation business, which is a classical restriction, as you see, and which Rubin also accepts, uh, as do I, I suspect most of the contributors to his, uh, his book. Uh, this is too narrow, so I'm going to be arguing now for an enhanced, a broader definition, and say that there's a second tier of the migration industry that includes firms whose customers are exclusively or preponderantly immigrants, not just transportation firms, but all firms, really, whose customers are preponderantly or exclusively immigrants or who benefit uh, commercially very, to a serious extent, not a trivial, but a serious extent, from the presence of immigrants in their, uh, among the ranks of their clientele. And I'm going to give three examples. Bankers, prostitutes, and saloon keepers. Um, and argue that all three of these were members of the uh, all three located within the United States were members of the uh, of the migration industry more broadly um, defined. The second tier, the first tier is the transportation area, uh, industry. The second tier greases the engines of international mobility, providing and providing services that facilitate mobility across borders and the realization of immigrants' goals and. They do this in various ways, among them by making life as an immigrant more satisfactory than it otherwise would have been. And I'll turn first. Oh, there they are, okay. I wondered if I forgot the bankers. I haven't, I'll get to them. First, I'm gonna to turn to prostitutes. Not often thought of as members of the migration industry. Um, the 19th century uh, immigration was preponderantly male. 130 men to 100 women. These men are all men in the prime of life, okay? And they are married, some are single, but it meant that there were a lot of men living under uh, harsh conditions doing the work of early industrialization by which I'm thinking building railroads, canals, um, ports, subways, and other heavy construction industries. And so the migration industry supplied foreign-born prostitutes, the servants, the immigrant men's sexual needs, and the immigrants were the customers of this industry. They weren't the exclusive customers, but there was a substantial, as you'll see, uh, international traffic in prostitution. This wasn't just casual prostitution. There were then, as now, sex traffickers who uh, brought women internationally across borders for the purposes of prostitution. Um, and uh, in recognition of this, what uh, an act was passed in 1911, and this, the Mann Act of 1911, prohibited the transportation of women across state lines for purposes of prostitution. It had to be written that way in order to make it a federal offense. If it's only prostitution within a state, it's not a federal offense, that's a state business. But if they transport them across state lines, then under Article 1 of the Constitution, Interstate Commerce Clause, 
it becomes a federal matter. So the Mann Act comes into effect as soon as a, a prostitute is transported across um, lines, state lines for purposes of prostitution. And this transportation was an organized crime activity of importance at that time. Uh, and as now, it's an important activity right now. Uh, but it was uh, was already important in 1911. It was the Mann Act was aimed at this component of the migration industry, and is still the main federal legislation in this field. Now, I turn to another um, tier, another part of the second tier: saloon keepers. Many European immigrants were heavier drinkers than the Americans. The Schnapps Belt ran from Germany to Russia, and I need not tell you the Irish drank a fair amount as well. Um, and the saloons in urban areas catered to immigrant men in cities, but rural Americans, Protestants, disapproved of alcohol consumption. Um, and uh, there was a cultural conflict in the United States related to consumption of alcohol. And it was partially a conflict, cultural conflict, between this proclivity of immigrants to drink and the resentment uh, of the native Protestant rural Americans of people who drank. Have you ever seen the um, famous canvas, American Gothic? I'm sure you've seen that canvas. Well, those people didn't approve of alcohol, okay? And so they saw the cities filled with not only prostitutes, but uh, the saloons where men drank uh, freely, um, and they disapproved of that. And the Prohibition Amendment of 1919, which I'm sure you're familiar, uh, prohibiting a production consumption of alcohol, uh, repealed in 1933, struck back at the evils of alcohol, thought to be importantly a product of immigration. So the conflict um, that led to the production of the the Prohibition Amendment was partially a conflict between the native-born and the foreign-born, partially a conflict, a cultural conflict, over the consumption of alcohol. Now, if we look at what saloons were, as opposed to the bad press they had, uh, we find that the bachelor men, the single men that I mentioned, but also the married men, used the ethnic saloons as clubs. The saloon was their restaurant, their bar, their political headquarters, their clubhouse, and their neighborhood social center. Um, drunkenness was unusual and its extent exaggerated in the press, but there's no doubt that drinking went on and was disapproved of. Um, what's, what more can I say about the saloons? Uh, the uh, political machine were often anchored in saloons. These were disapproved of political organizations located in cities. Uh, the Irish ran a big one in New York City, in Boston, and also in Chicago. Um, and the political machine obtained votes in exchange for favors at the lowest possible level. The favors were simply free drinks in the saloon. And so in this way, political power was acquired by people, by immigrant men who otherwise had no social organization that would have enabled them to mobilize their votes for the purposes of gaining political power, which was also resented by people who were on the other side of this uh, process. So uh, the saloons were, like the prostitution industry, commercial businesses that depended upon immigration and which made immigration more attractive because they genuinely approved the quality of life of the immigrants. And you see what I'm driving at. They genuinely approved the quality of life of the immigrants. Uh, another tier, uh, part of the second tier, were the immigrant bankers. Immigrant bankers took the immigrants' deposits, often from storefronts. They remitted funds to home countries. They loaned money for small businesses in the, in the U.S. Um, at that time, there were language and cultural barriers which uh, kept the immigrants out of banks. They didn't use banks. They were not really welcome in banks. Banks were for middle class people, or these were working class people. And they felt comfortable using storefront bankers. You went in, you made your deposit. The banker would then keep a record of the money that you deposited. 
often uh, the banker had connections, usually the banker had connections in the home country, and so if you deposited $100, the banker would notify his co-worker, often his own uh, relative in Italy or Romania or wherever it was, that you deposited $100, and then your relatives in that country could come to the banker and draw, uh, um, draw down the money. So he's making uh, possible for you to send remittances back to your, own, to your country. He's also enabling you to store your money in his house, in his bank, safely, or more or less safely. Some of the bankers were crooked. Um, most of them were not. Some of them were crooked. They went broke, and when they went broke, there was no insurance. They took down the savings of their, um, of their immigrant customers. All their customers were immigrants. There were no other customers. Uh, and like the uh, other two second-tier industries that I mentioned, uh, these contributed to uh, the welfare of immigrant life in the sense that without their service, it would have been much more difficult to be an immigrant. So they actually lightened the load of being an immigrant. I don't know if you've ever had the experience of living for a protracted period abroad. It's a, um, it's, it can be quite an unpleasant experience. Um, to live under those circumstances. Uh, it's very helpful to do so if you are a, a student of immigration, because then you know that it's no fun to be an immigrant. And whatever lightens the burden of immigrants uh, living abroad makes it easier to be an immigrant and therefore, in a way, facilitates the uh, immigration. So in a, in a sense, like the um, transportation companies, the second tier immigrant bankers, the saloons, the prostitutes, they're all part of making the real existence of the uh, immigrants uh, a more pleasant one, and in this way, uh, contributing to uh, the welfare of the immigrants and enhancing the number of immigrants who therefore come to the country. If you take all of those people away, the result is a, a, a less attractive life in the United States for those who chose to immigrate and therefore fewer people uh, arguably would come to the, uh, the country. Uh, Wall Street banks, immigrant banks needed immigrants or they had no customers. Some banks survived the end of immigration by going public. When the immigrants ran, ran out, the famously the Bank of Italy became the Bank of America, but most immigrant banks, including one, uh, including several just shut down. There are banks that went public. There's one in San Francisco called the Hibernian Bank. It has nothing to do with the Irish today, but at one point it did. Now it's called the Hibernian Bank. I doubt that anyone knows what Hibernian means, but there they are using the Hibernian Bank, which is a relic of an earlier period when the banks were ethnic uh, and they uh, survived the point where they were relying on an immigrant our plea of hell, to become general banks, just as the Bank of Italy now is the Bank of America. No one um, using that bank would think of it as an Italian bank, but it once was. Uh, most banks, however, did not effectuate that transition. They died when the immigration ended. Uh, so, now beyond that, I would argue that the whole ethnic economy, including newspapers and real estate agents, made it easier to be a migrant thus greasing the skid for migration and therefore qualifying a second-tier migration industry. So you see, I'm greatly expanding the size of what's in the migration industry above and beyond uh, the classic location of the migration industry, as strictly speaking, the steamship and transportation companies. However, when the immigrants assimilated and moved out of ethnic communities, the ethnic-owned businesses had to compete with the economic mainstream to retain their customers. Most didn't, because much of the ethnic economy depended on immigration for its competitive advantage. They needed immigration to continue. They didn't just want it, they needed it. Uh, and their contribution was really dependent upon having people who were immigrants. If the people were no longer immigrants, if they had language skills, if they had cultural skills, uh, they didn't need this as service anymore, uh, then the uh, raison d'etre of the uh, ethnic economy uh, was broached and the businesses went broke. But while this occurred, they were in the business. They were prom promoting immigration. So my conclusion, which I think has come in within the 40 minutes, uh, Andreas gave me, the migration industry should include second-tier firms that depend on immigration but do not provide transportation services. 
early 20th century authorities defined the migration industry too narrowly because they ignored at least the systemic second tier. How big is the migration industry? I propose that it includes second tier firms, and so it's much larger and more influential than if it does not. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Okay, guys, we've got time for a discussion. Any questions or any comments? I was just wondering about the repatriation of some nationalities. Were some, was that more likely among some nationalities than others? Are, are you referring to uh, repatriation, the re people who return to the Yeah, of their own volition. Oh, yeah. definitely much more common among some than among others, yes. Like what, what, what nationalities? Well, um, the South, uh, Southeast Europeans often returned. Um, Southern Europeans often returned. Um, in many cases, this was the fulfillment of their initial plan. That is, they had been a sojourning migration from the beginning. They never intended to stay. They always intended to come, earn some money, and then with the money to return to their homeland. Uh, in fact, probably, um, just as, this is not a wild guess, but it is a guess, 80% of those who got off the boat intended to do that, and only 40% actually did. Because things happen when you get off that boat. I mean, you know, you, you, you find someone, you get married, you buy a house, so you have to make commitments and so forth, and sooner you don't, you don't actually return. But most, many people did intend to return and did actually effectuate their return. So at the other extreme, the Jews from, 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 uh, from Russia and Poland hardly ever returned because they were under uh, pressure to leave. They were persecuted in their homeland. They had nothing to go back to, so hardly any of them returned to their homeland. Um, so there were huge differences in, in ethnic groups in terms of their repatriation. Yeah. Um, it's interesting because one of your last points, you were talking about how sort of when the ethnic economy or the immigrant economy ceases to become ethnic and, and that moment we're either losing immigrants or needing to compete with the mainstream. And on the other hand, quite a bit of your work focuses on ethnic entrepreneurship and migrant entrepreneurship. So when does migrant or ethnic entrepreneurship or aspects of the migration industry cease to become migrant or ethnic? It ceases to be at the point at which um, the group in question becomes completely acculturated and assimilated. Uh, at that point, which is more or less asymptotically approached but never actually attained, um, there, uh, there is no difference between these people and anyone else. Uh, so basically they are part of the, the broader society, if you want to put it that way, or they're part of the mainstream. They no longer have um, an ethnic language. They no longer have ethnic cultural concerns or conditions. Um, and uh, so that's the theoretical point at which that happens. Um, now, uh, as you know, we no longer believe in uh, or advocate assimilation. Uh, the current view is that uh, ethnic minorities Determining the European ethnic minorities have what is called symbolic ethnicity at this point. That is to say, if for example you have an Irish surname, just to use the example that you're involved, um, uh, you're not really Irish, but you might uh, you might make something out of St. Patrick's Day, okay, that somebody else wouldn't, um, as purely symbolic and. Uh, Conversely, if your friends have an Italian surname, uh, then they might uh, challenge the Irish surnames to a basketball game. But um, that would be about the extent of it. There's really not much difference between these people at all. So symbolic ethnicity is all that's left of the uh, European origins of the, uh, uh, of the 19th and early 20th century at this point. You can say that ethnicity has completely disappeared from the white or European origin population. You could say that it isn't meaningful in the way it used to be. Uh, 
even in my lifetime, growing up as I did in New York City, I've seen huge differences in uh, ethnic white behavior and the meaning of ethnicity among ethnic whites. It's just not what it used to be, even in my lifetime. So uh, my life was relatively short in this historical context. So, uh, but your question uh, does have an answer, and I think the answer is when they cease to be, when they just, supposing, for example, someone is buying halal meat, okay, they can't buy that at Sainsbury's. But at the point where they uh, no longer care about being uh, Muslim because they're fully assimilated into Irish society, then Sainsbury's becomes a competitor for them in terms of where they buy their meat. And the halal butcher no longer has a ready-made ethnic clientele available to buy that meat. Now you may say, well, they will never give up their Islamic faith and never stop uh, buying halal meat. But I suppose they will, if they don't give it up, at least weaken their devotion to I'm just guessing, judging by what I see going on in the world. In 50 or 100 years, they will, their devotion to Islamic identity will weaken. And so maybe they will be willing to eat non halal meat, even though they recognize that if they were to be a good Muslim, they should eat halal meat. Just as I know many Muslims um, who uh, drink wine, even though they know that they, as a good Muslim, should not touch wine, but they do drink it. And when they do, they start drinking wine, then they become a customer for the wine merchant. And uh, uh, when they stop buying halal meat, they become a customer for Sainsbury's. So then Sainsbury's and the halal meat market come into competition. And uh, the, uh, there's a possibility that the halal meat market will go out of business. OK, Chris, first, and then uh, come back. Uh, yeah, if I understood it properly, your reference to the early 20th century commission was suggesting that the commission had some notion of a kind of natural rate of immigration, you know, something which would be determined by pushful factors uh, and would see sort of deviations from that as a sort of distortion of, of some natural equilibrium. And I presume that what you're suggesting here, that developing this notion of migration industries, is that, that there isn't any such natural, you know, number, that it, it can be contested on the basis of of interest with you know employers and trade unions being one of these parts of it, but these other institutions uh they're developing again becoming part of the you know debate or you know um, discussion or negotiation of, of what is appropriate okay. your question is a very good one i hadn't thought of it that way but maybe that is an implication of what i'm saying um, uh, they are they are trying to make a distinction between what is natural what is artificial trying to argue that there are more immigrants than there should be, uh, that something improper is going on and that they want to stop it with legislation if they possibly can. Um, what is going on is fundamentally a misrepresentation of the advantages of, of immigration in their opinion, um, leading to the presence of large numbers of greenhorns uh, who, uh, as I said, uh, expect the streets to be paved with gold. That's a, a phrase from the terminology of the time. Um, and that these people had been misled by um, those who had a motive to mislead them, and this should be prevented. And if it could be prevented, then there would be fewer unemployed immigrants, underemployed immigrants, badly housed immigrants, and there would be less social problems in the cities of the United States, because if these problems could be relieved, then, um, uh, then the uh, the slums uh, would be uh, more livable because there wouldn't be as many people uh, competing for work or competing for housing. So the uh, advantages, so the, uh, the social problems in the country would be reduced. And they could reduce these problems by preventing the artificial stimulation of immigration above and beyond some uh, threshold level that was deemed to be normal because they realized that they needed immigrants, but they didn't need this many. That was the point. We need some, but we don't need this many. We've got too many. We can't deal with all these people. How can we get some of these people to go back? They're under illusions about what they're going to find. And unfortunately, then they come over here and uh, they're, they're misrep they're, they discover that things aren't the way they should be. But while they're, they're discovering that, they're creating social problems over here. 
So uh, I guess I am saying that uh, you know that that line is is a is a conceptual one, but I don't think it's really a realistic empirical one. There are a lot of agencies that immediately kick in. I mentioned three, and beyond those three, the whole ethnic economy that immediately kick in to make immigration more palatable and more enjoyable an experience than it otherwise would have, to make it easier to be an immigrant. Um, and uh, you can't say that those are artificial. They are almost spontaneously uh, evolved in order to increase and enhance the experience of immigration and make life easier for the immigrants, and that results in more immigration. Yeah, it's almost it's the same question in a way. Um, like, I'm very interested in this, but I find the concept itself a bit, a bit slippery. Because there is this issue really as to what's exogenous and what's endogenous. You know, if uh, what was going on was what you described at first with the, 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 the tree and, and the tree on the car, and yeah. so on, then the analogy might be the shift, say, from sailing ships to steamships. And that would really make it cheaper for people to go. So you'd get a bigger, for any level of pushing, you'd get more people. Yes, that's true. You are you are reducing the transactions costs. Yes, you know? that's true too. Yes, that's quite but right. Some of the other um, examples you gave seem to me to be, you know, I'm an economist, and, you know, and I would think of them as um, endogenous. You know, so it's it's the emigration of the Irish that generated the bars, not the other way around. You know, it's it's not that the bars were there independent, and they say, well, look. Uh, please come because we're there. And um, and then as soon as the Irish migration stops, uh, it's the way you describe the banks. The banks have either have to change their game or uh, or quit. And uh, like there's an Irish with the emigrant uh, uh, industrial things, like is the classic exa Irish example, mm -hmm. just like the Bank of Italy is right. for the Italian community. But uh, like, so it seems to me that uh, you know, to some extent, the, the, the prostitutes and the bars and the banks may not have had much extra impact in terms of causing more migrants in the way the shift to the steamship uh, would have had. I suppose there's also, when you talk about the migration industry, there's a bit of a, a distinction to be made between advertising, which is about market share. So you would get Cunard saying, we bring you over, uh, but that's at the extent of the uh, uh, of the White Star Line, but it doesn't really increase the number of people who travel. It maybe shifts some of them from one group to the other. So I'm thinking of the net impact of the of the of the um, of this concept. You know, to what extent did it really uh, uh, increase uh, migration, or is it the case that the Dillon Commission didn't like immigration anyway, so was looking for any kind of reason? Uh, it's for sure they did uh, the not <laughs> no. It's for sure they didn't like it. So they're bringing this up as a kind of a, you know, in a way it's, to some extent it's the bogus argument, uh, but it can be used as part of the anti-immigrant rhetoric, but it probably doesn't have that much of an impact on the number of people who travel. Well, uh, it's for sure they didn't like immigration. Uh, uh, I would say, um, however, I... Uh, and, you know, I, I don't think the argument is entirely bogus, um, and uh, I'll, I'll give you another, another illustration. The cigarette companies advertising smoking. Now, okay, so they're advertising cigarettes, and they want you to switch from your present brand to another brand. You're smoking Philip Morris, they want you to smoke Campbell's instead. But doesn't that also have the secondary derived effect of encouraging smoking generally? And they show the Marlboro, Marlboro Man, and the Marlboro Man is smoking Marlboros. And impressionable young people, most people begin smoking uh, if you go to the age of 18, including me, I was damn fool enough to smoke. Um, uh, and so impressionable young people smoke, and uh, they may smoke Marlboros, they may smoke and something else, but the point is advertising doesn't just shift people from one brand to another, it actually encourages people to smoke, which is why, now that smoking um, is being discouraged, uh, prohibitions are in effect on, on advertising of cigarettes. And so I would suppose that advertising the advantages of traveling on the Cunard line uh, 
uh, would eventuate possibly also similarly in the in promotion of uh, of our encouragement of advertising, of, excuse me, of immigration, because Cunard didn't just advertise that, oh well, you know, be more comfortable on the Cunard line than you would be on another line or a Voss West. They also promoted the advantages of being, in, and if you look at travel posters, even today, if you go to a travel agency or go online to a travel agency and you, you want to, for example, read about the possibility of taking a vacation somewhere, They'll show you a glorified image of what it's like. They won't show you waiting in line at the airport, okay? They won't show you being gypped by taxi drivers who drive you around to, to push up the price. They won't show you uh, having to deal with, uh, with greedy hotel keepers. Uh, they won't show you uh, um, long waiting lines at the, uh, the museum um, or any of the other negatives that uh, invariably are accompanying the tourist experience. They give you a pretty picture of what it is to go to Spain or to go to France or to go, for that matter, to uh, Los Angeles. They don't show you the traffic jams. They don't show you the air pollution. They don't show you the uh, thugs lurking in the, uh, the, uh, <laughs> in, the, uh, in, the in the alleys with a gun. Um, so uh, traffic uh, travel agencies promote uh, immigration and they might do so by, by giving people a pretty fine image of what it is. And it's certainly the case that they hoped to uh, reduce immigration by reducing the ability of these people to do what they were doing. Uh, the other point that you made uh, is, is also very true. The Irish didn't come originally to get saloons. But given that the saloons existed, it made it easier to be an Irish immigrant uh, thereafter. So there's a kind of, that's why you can't say that the, the migration industry causes the migration. You can only say that it ex ex accelerates it or makes it easier to be a migrant. Because if you come uh, as an Irish immigrant or an Italian immigrant and there's some social center for you to go to, then it just makes it so much easier to be an immigrant. I mean, even today in Los Angeles, where 40% uh, of the population are foreign born, there are people who come from Mexico or Central America who live their whole lives without acquiring English. They never need to speak English. Every aspect of their life can be conducted in Spanish. Uh, everything that they do, the grocery store, the, the, uh, the, the person who does their nails, the person who does their hair, the, uh, the place where they buy their luggage, whatever you think of, it's all in Spanish. They don't need to learn English, which makes it you know, incredibly much easier to be an immigrant in Los Angeles from uh, a Spanish-speaking country. Okay, I, I, I have a separate question for you. Uh, um, you know, if we apply some of those insights to contemporary, to the present, right, uh, and different countries from which people come, um, the, are there, is there any significant change? I was thinking about the you know, migration industry. I think about the coyotes, right, the, those who smuggle yes. uh, uh, Mexican or Central American workers over the border uh, illegally. Um, and uh, I'm sure there are other, other forms of help uh, that would pop up. I mean, do uh, you, think, you think this can still be vital or in a, in a changed way? The coyote uh, is an example of this, but he's in the transportation industry. And yeah, it wouldn't be second tier, but you know, uh, I'm sure there must be similar things in, in terms of changed infrastructure, you know, for on the second tier, right? Of course, I mean, it applies straight, straight across the uh, the barrier, yes, of course. The, uh, there's there's huge uh, second tier migration industry in uh, in the uh, in the Spanish speaking uh, migrant communities of the United States. I just mentioned a giant ethnic economy that that will accommodate any you know, aspect of your life. Uh, you really uh, never need to learn English because, for example, you're likely to work in a, a Spanish speaking workplace. Um, and all your work associates will be Spanish speaking and you'll live in a neighborhood with other Spanish speaking people and your shopping will all be done in Spanish, your doctor will be Spanish, your dentist is Spanish. Um, when you go to even to a public agency there will be someone there speaking Spanish to you. So um, uh, the inconvenience of being a minority language speaker is greatly inhibited which makes it much easier to, to come from Mexico or Central America and live in the United States. That's, the, that's the, uh, the only point I wanted to make here. Now, uh, in terms of this book, I mean, I wrote a, a, a historical chapter on this because of 
the book, as I said, consists of a number of other chapters written by other persons, all of which would be uh, contemporary illustrations of the uh, concept of migration industry. And I thought it would be useful for the editor and read to have a chapter in there to show that this wasn't so new, that there had been migration industries before, uh, that migrations, and that would imply that migrations characteristically have migration industries associated with their conduct. <coughs> and, um, so, you know, that would basically support the, um, the uh, validity and uh, robustness of the concept in that it's not something that originated only after 1980 in the United States of America, but it's something that has been with migration for at least 100 years and probably more. I, I, made, I had no trouble finding that these illustrations, I think if I'd gone into even early 19th century, possibly even 18th century migration literature, I could have found it there too. But this was enough to illustrate the point that I was trying to make in the context of this book. Basically trying to validate or support, substantiate and strengthen the concept of the migration industry as a tool for analyzing, uh, for analyzing migrations. I think I've meant it a little bit more in terms of you know critical mass. Um, I mean, does it become a kind of almost a kind of self-fulfilling prophecy once you have a critical mass? And with you know Mexicans and Spanish-speaking people, it would be uh, it would always jump into your eye, right? Uh, it, it's so evident. But does that mean it then creates a momentum of its own, that thereby attracting more? Has it enough critical mass on social capitals from networks that then triggers even more migration? I think that's. Well, uh, the, uh, the uh, article doesn't say so, but let's uh, think about whether that might not be the case. Uh, uh, and this requires me to uh, go beyond the boundary that I drew for the purposes of this article and to begin to look at um, an aspect of the project, uh, that problem that I haven't looked at, but I'm aware probably exists, and that is the political influence of the migration industry. Um, and I've done uh, only the most superficial uh, thinking about that. But I have the impression that the migration industry does have a political influence within the country, or within the country of destination. And so I think the migration industry in the United States in the period under question here was a political actor. Um, so for example, if we were to look at opposition to the Immigration Act of 1924, which was based on a great deal of hostility uh, toward immigration, including what we would now call racist hostility that was directed not to non-whites, but to, not to non-whites only, but to whites also. There was racist hostility in the United States directed to whites from Southern and Eastern Europe who were considered to be of an inferior ethnic stock. So if you look at the opposition to the, the act, the opposition was overruled, the act passed, you find that the immigrant com communities themselves were in the forefront of opposition to that. And you would probably find, if you look beyond that, that the uh, ethnic economy uh, was providing resources that mobilized and strengthened the ability of the immigrant communities to be politically effective. So in that sense, they are now promoting immigration in a more direct way, you see, than simply by providing services which make immigration easier make it easier to be an immigrant living abroad. And let's turn again to your question a second way. And I think your question is a very good one, and you're making me think about things I hadn't thought about. If we think about the migration network all by itself, and the work that it is supposed to do, according to Douglas Massey, um, and the uh, promotion of cumulative causation, which is the word uh, that you were, I think, the concept that you were looking at, right? cumulative causation, the migration network generates a kind of uh, critical mass which then builds momentum toward migration all on itself. Supposing that all you had was the migration network doing that and you didn't also have the support of the migration industry. That is to say, the cumulative causation is there. But what is missing is all of this ethnic economy business that is producing uh, services that support and promote the quality of life of the immigrants abroad. Well, this would be a less effective, less dynamic, um, and less effective 
migration network in terms of its ability to generate that cumulative causation for the simple reason that uh, the life that you get when you when you get where you're going is not as attractive as it otherwise would be. Um, if you uh, or I or anyone has to go to a foreign language country, a foreign language environment, imagine that you go to Korea, a place I've actually been and have lived briefly in Korea, albeit in an English-speaking bubble. If I had to live in Korea as a solitary individual without any resources on my own, I would have a very, very unpleasant life because I wouldn't be able to speak to anyone and uh, that would be a, a miserable kind of existence. So when I went to Korea, it was tolerable for me because I was in an English-speaking bubble and the Koreans I came into contact with spoke English and I was with other English-speaking persons and so life was, uh, was tolerable for me in Korea. But having to go there without having that would have been terrible I would have left Korea and would never have gone if I thought it was going to have to happen. To happen. So my, my idea is therefore a thought experiment where you strip away from the cumulative causation idea, with which I think many, many of you are familiar. Are you all familiar with the concept of cumulative causation, or do I need to uh, introduce that too? I'm not seeing a huge amount of, uh, <laughs> of awareness. All right, so let me go back, uh, back stop a little. I told you at the beginning. Do we have time for this? I think we do, right? Yeah, if it's not another lecture, it's really. <laughs> <laughs> you remember at the beginning, I said that the, the, the interest in migration uh, sociology has been not in bushes and poles, but in facilitation. One was cumulative causation and network migration. The other was the subordinate and lesser of the two was the migration industry. So now I'm going to turn about to the, to the greater, the more important thematic development in the last 20 years, which has been the, the development of that network uh, theory of migration. Um, the network theory of migration has also been present from the very beginning. The same evidence that I showed you here would support the awareness in the early 20th century of uh, the role of networks that is a family and friends in supporting and encouraging people to be migrants, um, that's been um, uh, that's that was there uh, very early. The next stage was reached somewhere around 1960 when people began to realize that the networks not only made people familiar with um, migration, but they actually organized it, and that uh, the organization of migration, for example, the selection of destinations, was by on the basis of networks, that the selection of occupations was on the basis of networks, the selection of neighborhoods within cities was on the basis of networks, and that therefore the, the networks were organizing the migration, which was a step forward conceptually from what they had in the early 20th, late 19th century. And then around, uh, I think it was 1985, Douglas Massey published an article in which he introduced the uh, concept of cumulative causation for migration. He borrowed this concept from uh, from uh, Swedish Gunnar Myrdal, um, and who had not used it in context of migration, but Massey you know, built it into the context of migration. And he made the point in this uh, very uh, important essay that um, Migration networks not only uh, organize the migration, they actually make it happen um, because they reduce the cost of migration, by which he meant not just the money cost, but the emotional and social costs of migration. That the, uh, mi the migration, therefore, once it becomes a mature migration and outlives the stage of uh, in initial stage, um, is a migration uh, that builds upon the capability of migrating from the place of origin to the destination at a very low cost. And indeed, Mike Massey makes the point that uh, at a certain stage of the migration process, someone in western Mexico wakes up in the morning, a young man of 18, young woman of the same age, and realizes that it's easier to go to Los Angeles or Houston than it is to stay in the village. 
because the migration network is so well organized. Everything is in place for you to go to that distant place, get a job, get a place to live, all the rest of it. And if you stay in the village, uh, it's going to be hard for you. So that it's actually easier at that point, thanks to the uh, existence of the mature network, to to migrate than it would be to stay in your uh, in your destination village. So at this point, the migration network has built up what he calls cumulative causation, and the, the mere existence of a ma ma mature network is beginning to direct people uh, in and of itself, independent of the push and pull. You see, they may initially have started the migration in the first place. So now the push and the pull. Uh, are in a certain sense pushed to the background. They're no longer the, thing, the main thing to look at. Now you have to look at the, the network that is pushing, the, that is enabling the migration to the point that it, it, uh, it is happening uh, no longer because of the push and pull, but because of itself. It is self promoting, self producing. And so uh, getting back to uh, that's the that's the concept of cumulative causation. Um, I have had a uh, personally a, a long-term uh, relationship with it and with Douglas Massey. Uh, I remember a conversation that I had with Douglas Massey. Uh, now I'm getting into something that really is our I don't know if you want to hear this. <laughs> yes, <sir. laughs> yeah, maybe we can do this off coffee or so. But I mean, we're emptying here, so you know, there's someone I, you know. I don't know what the plans are for other people here, so, so you know, maybe we... Oh, tell us your Just briefly. Yeah. Oh, all right. Uh, I had this conversation with Douglas Massey years ago. I said, D Douglas, uh, at some point the migration network must run out of steam. I mean, because um, everyone can't migrate. Uh, and at some point the migration uh, is going to run into conditions at the point of uh, destination that make it impossible for it to continue. And he disputed that saying that, well, if you look at Western Mexico, there are whole villages which are simply depopulated. No one lives there anymore. And the village is completely gone. I guess that is true in, in, in Ireland, too, actually. Some of these famine villages that I was introduced to uh, while in Connemara, apparently, places which uh, no longer exist at all, possibly because of uh, migration. But in any event, uh, my own research subsequently published in that book, Deflecting Immigration, um, which uh, Andreas mentioned, um, was to show that, that what happens in a long-term network-driven migration, such as Messi envisaged, is the buildup of, uh, of, of an ethnic population, I was thinking of Mexicans, uh, in certain selected destinations, I was thinking of the top destinations to which Mexicans go because of the network of which number one is Los Angeles, the city in which I live. And when you get a big build, build up of these people, the result is that they drive down the wages of their fellow Mexicans because there's so many of them competing for the same kind of jobs. And they also increase the uh, rents in the neighborhoods they inhabit because there's so many of them looking to, to rent uh, homes or apartments in the same neighborhoods, as a result of which the conditions under which the Mexicans live in Los Angeles could be shown to have deteriorated between 1980 and 2000 as a result of the influx of Mexicans, which then drove the Mexicans to go to new places other than Los Angeles. So that is a that is a new point. It's a point I've introduced within the last few years in the dialogue about the migration network theory. Uh, but the original migration network theory is as I recounted it to you. Okay, thank you very much for an enlightening talk and thank uh, thanks for coming to us and uh, uh, yeah.